Hey, Andy, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Brian? Not too bad. Not too bad. What a uh, what a crazy month it's been for crypto, huh? It has. It has. By the All way, right, are we so, recorded yet, or are we gonna go in a sec? Yeah, I I think yeah, we're definitely recording. We're definitely Perfect. recording. All right, I'll I'll just go through the go through the the uh, the intros and stuff. So, all right. So, welcome everyone. Welcome, Brian. Good to see you. Good to see you too. All right, so today is, uh, well, it's Thursday, the 10th of March. It's probably Wednesday, the Wednesday evening, 9th of March, over at your side, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, 6.30 p.m. over here on the West Coast in the U.S. Fantastic. All right, and for those of you uh, in the in Malaysia, in, in Singapore, we're Thursday, the 10th of March at 10.36 a.m., Okay, so he hope everyone's doing well and everyone's staying safe. Um, as usual, we always have a special guest, Brian Quinlivan from Santiman. A uh, very big and warm welcome to you, Brian. Thanks for having me, Andy. It's always a pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to going over uh, a lot of a lot of interesting metrics that we've seen over the past month as Bitcoin has roller coastered up and down with all of these real world events. Oh yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to to today's session. Uh, so, look, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, you know, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, if you if you know, feel free to share, like, and subscribe. Right? If if you're on YouTube, uh, make sure you click on the bell icon and choose all, so that every time we come on, you're notified. If you're on Facebook, follow us. If you're tuning in on Twitch, follow us. Uh, don't forget to tag your friends if you know anyone who might be interested in, in this topic, right? And I think right now it's a pretty hot topic. Uh, feel free to throw in any questions so that we can answer them um, at the next session, right? So at the next session, so we'll look at your comments and then we'll, we'll try to answer them at the next session. Uh, a few announcements before we get started. Uh, we have a crypto preview session uh, on, the, on March the 17th. That's next week. So if you're interested to find out a little bit more about how to begin or start investing in crypto, uh, leave a comment in the section, right? Just say class. Someone will get in touch with you or respond to your comment. Uh, we recently had a, you know, had a class in January, January. Yeah. And it was a hit, right? We had, we had quite a few skeptics that started on day one and by Day three, they were orange pilled, and they were all for it. So, uh, so yeah. So look, uh, I love a good challenge. Uh, I, I love getting skeptics into the class. So, yeah. If if you um, if you're interested, do type class into the comment section below. So the next class is happening April eighth to tenth, eighth to tenth. So if you're if you're interested, uh, do let us know. Okay, I think that should be the end of the announcements. Um, Again, welcome to those of you who are just joining us. I am joined today by Brian from Santiman. Uh, I will let Brian introduce himself. And uh, over to you, Brian. Great to meet everybody once again. For those who have seen me on this channel before, thanks for tuning in uh, again. And for those of you seeing me for the first time, I am the content and marketing director at Santiman. Uh, my job is to both identify trends uh, that are going on on our data platform, uh, where we cover about 2,000 plus assets uh, through both on-chain and social means. And then I also market those insights through our Twitter insights, all sorts of things. So uh, we're a growing company that's gained a lot of traction over the last couple of years, um, due in large part to making a lot of correct market calls and, and seeing a lot of uh, things behind the curtains that are happening on various blockchains that the public and TA traders may not get to see too much. So uh, that's what we'll be doing here for the next, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, Andy. And uh, we'll kind of we'll kind of see how it goes. There are definitely some topics I can touch on. And by all means, feel free to ask questions about anything that uh, our platform might be able to help provide some light on. Yeah, definitely. And thanks for the introduction, Brian. So so tell us, I mean, the last time you've been on was exactly a month ago. Uh, what's been happening, right? What's been happening on chain in the world? What's what's going on? Yeah, it's been it's been a ride, right? We had uh, a month ago. It feels like it was a year ago now with all the things that have happened. Uh, we were talking a lot about the Fed and inflation and how 
that might impact the future of cryptocurrency as well as, of course, equities and uh, even gold and silver, things like that. And, you know, when we were really at the price bottom for Bitcoin, I think we were around like the 33 to 34K level in late January. Uh, there were there were a lot of attributions to why the price was going down, mostly involving, uh, you know, inflation and the the very obvious correlative peg right now that Bitcoin and Ethereum and much of cryptocurrency has with the S and P 500. So when the those prices really started to tank at the beginning of the year here in 2022, uh, Bitcoin was kind of being being dragged down with it. Uh, some argue that Bitcoin is actually leading the charge and the S&P is following Bitcoin. I have my doubts about that, but uh, my job isn't to provide uh, opinions. It's more to, so to show what the data is indicating. And we, I can definitely share my screen and we can okay. go into that. Um, and then on top of that, we can talk about how the war, which was announced just about two weeks ago now, has yeah. been impacting crypto itself with, in both a good and a late, actually lately in a very good way. Uh, when it first was announced, uh, it was it was negatively impacting crypto. So we'll touch on that too. And just to give everyone a, a little bit of context on how prices look, we have a pretty nifty and handy dandy screener here that you guys can always tune into. And if you sort by 30 days here, like I just did, and then go by descending market cap, you've got the top 100 or so, depending on how wide your screen is, it might go over or under 100. Um, It'll show you the returns percentage wise of all of these assets. You can see, I'm not even sure what chain Bing is all about, but if we ignore that anomaly, um, Anchor Protocol has had a good 30 day stretch, Waves has had a good stretch, and Luna's had a good, very good stretch. But other than that, it's almost all a sea of red, you know, maybe a few other positive returns around that time. But you look at Bitcoin. Through all that it's been through, you know, going down to 33, 34K, going up to just about 45K, and now sitting here at about 40.9, it's down about 7% over the last 30 days. Ethereum down a little more of a severe number, 15%. And a lot of other assets are apparently following along mostly with Ethereum right now. Ethereum tends to be kind of a, a peg for altcoins about it a bit, especially if it's an ERC-20 project. Um, but overall, you know, it's it's been a tough stretch for traders ever since really going back to the all-time highs that were made in mid-November, I believe November 10th uh, and 9th, depending in, on where you are in the world, uh, yeah. when we hit a little above 68K and almost 5,000 for Ethereum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So yeah, so it's it, it's definitely been an interesting ride in the last 30 days. And, and you're right, when we, you know, the last time we had this session, uh, we were talking about the Fed, uh, you know, increasing interest rates and, and how it was affecting, it was affecting prices. Um, and then, as you said, two weeks ago, we, you know, the, the war started and um, things have just been pretty crazy. Yeah, they've certainly shifted. Those events have absolutely shifted the way cryptocurrency would have gone if those events never occurred, right? Uh, yeah. Some argue there was already a little bit of fear of war baked in at the time that it was officially announced. And so I've made some um, some charts here. Lately, you know, we've been looking at things like um, the executive order that Biden made involving cryptocurrency. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first and foremost, let me pull up uh, how how the war situation has actually impacted prices. And if I type in here a few words, it's as easy as going something like war or Russia or Ukraine or Putin or um, why am I flaking on the president's name of Ukraine? Uh, Zelensky. Zelensky, yeah, and the spelling, I, I'm going to put you that. Yeah, we're we'll leave it alone. That. <laughs> we'll pretend that Zelensky isn't part of this query. It won't change much. Don't worry. Sure. Uh, this is the beauty of live streaming, folks. So don't hate me for <laughs> not remembering that name. Um, social volume. So this indicates, based on just crypto platforms, how often these four words are being brought up on specific 
crypto platforms that we have access to. Uh, and that is a very large, expansive amount. These aren't just niche little groups. Um, it's anything public on Twitter, Telegram, Reddit. Uh, and on top of that, even though it isn't shown here graph wise, it's also baking in Discord and a few other pro traders chats. So we can actually see based on platform how often these things are being brought up. Many of you are familiar with Google Trends and being able to do something similar. But the beauty of this on sentiment is that we're only looking at how much these topics are being, pop, topics are being brought up on crypto platforms instead of just you know random Googlers who have nothing to do with crypto. So this gives us a lot of insight because of the fact that we're able to see how these trends typically let prices play out following the uh, the hyped up intervals of discussion where they're they're really firing off frequently. And we can of course see that the highest moment <coughs> that all of this was brought up was on the 24th, might have been the 23rd where you are. Uh, that's when of course Putin announced that Russia was officially declaring war on Ukraine. Everything skyrocketed, the prices plummeted. But yeah. interestingly, the reaction came a little bit delayed after it was announced right around here. So a few hours went by and after the price really bottomed out and the mainstream crypto uh, discussers really recognized that this was happening, that's when they started talking about it and getting fearful going, oh my God, war, you know, prices are just gonna continue plummeting. And guess mm -hmm. what happens when the mainstream figures out uh, some sort of FUD related subject? The price goes up and the reason is because crypto now and potentially even forever will always go the path of the mainstream's least expected direction. Uh, the same occurs with something like buy the dip or buy the dips. We can see this is not the best example because many of the mainstream actually called the dip here and were somewhat correct, not, not initially. So if I really zoomed in here, uh, we could see that there was another dip after this major dip call by the crowd happened. And then after they eased up right here, this little bar, that's when the actual dip by opportunity happened. Um, this one's a better example. Many people called the dip here and said it's time to buy after this one. But then prices continue to go down until we had much less discussion right around here. And that's when the actual rise happened, at least temporarily. So, you know, just a few quick examples of how social volume can be used. And now I'd like to get to the current situation, which is, of course, Biden's exec executive order. Everyone knows that the U.S. and our regulatory systems here have a lot to do with the world prices for Bitcoin. At some point that may change. But for now, the U.S. still has a large uh, impact on the direction of prices whenever news comes out. And we can see that the way Biden's name has come up in the news, it's essentially been a reversal indicator, right? We see here a huge grouping of social volume, price goes up. Huge grouping of social volume. This, of course, happened when the war was declared, price goes up. Then here, more recently, just about a week ago, we see a few isolated spikes and this called the top. Uh, I believe this was when the executive order was first being uh, hypothesized on how it would go, right? So Biden is an interesting word to keep an eye on. We, of course, can also see uh, the word executive, which is a little more specific to what this subject matter that happened yesterday pertained to. And we can see that this essentially worked as a top indicator where mm -hmm. everyone said, okay, prices are surging because of the executive order. And then boom, the price starts to decline again doesn't mean it'll continue, but perhaps if these social volume bars continue to stay high, that means there will be a little more downside. So that's a good thing to keep an eye on. That's a, that's a very good tip on how, yeah, to, yeah. how to use the platform. Yeah, thanks. Of course. And then order here, same thing. Just one big spike, price goes down. You get the point. Um, but that's a little bit about social volume, and I hope I didn't use too much time on that. But I, I just wanted to express the significance about how these real world events can and will continue to impact where crypto goes next with each passing headline. 
Yeah, that's um, that that's no, that that's actually a very good uh, example of of how useful you know this sentiment platform is, right? I mean, it's uh, it's that the data is there now. You're mining it and looking for patterns and and looking for, you know, effectively uh, what happens to price um, when social volume increases, mm. or what happen what happens after when when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, completely. And then, of course, we've got on-chain indicators to take a look at, too. Um, we can see active addresses. Uh, it's mostly been up and down. Um, I can switch it to daily active addresses that might be a little more uh, appropriate here. But we can see that in the daily active address field, it's been a slight decline. This pink indicator is essentially a smooth moving average. Prices are, or I'm sorry, uh, the amount of unique addresses interacting on the BTC network has taken a slight slide uh, mm -hmm. ever since the all-time high that occurred here in mid-November. Uh, it actually topped out right at that all-time high too, which is something to, to note. Um, and then we can also look at uh, the average trader returns. And this is an important one. This is probably a top three metric that most of our sentiment staff uh, really regard to be a, a an indicator with a lot of alpha. Generally speaking, we look for uh, we look for around negative fifteen percent as the the bottom ish uh, for for most assets. And when it falls below it, that is when uh, we tend to see a big a big correction upwards. So something like this was a perfect example in late January when everyone was still talking about the Fed and inflation at the time. Uh, and as soon as it fell below, boom, bottom indicator, you would have had a great time uh, with your investments if you bought when all the other average trading returns were heavily in the red. Same here, huge, huge MVRV spiked down. It got to as low as negative 19%. Actually had a little more downside afterwards, but as long as it stayed in the negative, you'd feel comfortable staying in your position. But as soon as it got positive, that would have been the sign to be a little weary that something could correct down. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so MVRV is a great, great metric to keep an eye on. And right now it's pretty much back break even after having the big surge the last couple of days and then the slight correction just in the past 10 to 12 hours, I believe. Another important thing to take a look at is supply and exchanges, which has encouragingly continued to just drop. I can even zoom out here and show just how crazy this has been. Over the last year, we look at where things were a year ago, 14.03% of Bitcoin was sitting on exchanges here. It got all the way up to 14.32 in mid-May before a huge plummet down all the way down to where we are now at about 10.65%. So, that generally is regarded as a good thing because with less supply on an exchange, there generally is less probability of a large sell-off occurring because there's simply less supply that is able to be exchanged. And when coins are moved to an exchange, there's only one action that can be, well, technically two. You can hold it on an exchange or you can sell, but you're not moving those coins onto, new, onto an exchange to buy them because you already own them. That's why declining supply and exchanges is a long-term good indicator or, or bullish indicator, I should say, uh, if you are able to be patient and you're not so much of a swing trader as much as a hodler. So very good sign there. And another important metric to look at is Exactly how many, let me switch this up, exactly how many Bitcoin are owned by a key tier of whales. Uh, we look at whales that hold anywhere between 100 to 10,000 Bitcoin as that key tier because anything above 10,000 we have found to be mostly exchanges, but 100 up to 10,000 generally is that largest tier where traders are actually active and reacting to prices. Now I need to switch this to 
the price of Bitcoin, which I can put right there. And now we can take a look at how, how solid the holders of this particular tier of Bitcoin are correlating with the price of Bitcoin. So generally, something like this would be a perfect indicator that you want to be weary of prices dropping. And even though there was one more leg up high, because these whales were already dropping and dumping their, their assets onto smaller hold, holders and traders, uh, the, the eventual retracement that started happening was extremely swift and damaging to anyone that were still holding the bags. Uh, and that's generally what we see. Same here, you know, on the other end. Huge accumulation in mid-June all the way to early August. And the price kind of lags behind. So that's why whales can be such a, an important and helpful metric. Now, where we are now, we've dropped all the way down to about 48.4% of the supply held by these whales. And that's relatively low still. So prices essentially stayed about even with that. We'd want to see a little bit of a pickup of that pink line while the price stays down. And that would be a very, very solid sign that the prices are going to start to turn around and you can be confident in buying what is still considered to be a long-term dip that's going on right now. So I'll take a pause there. I know we're probably close on time already, Andy, and I don't want to take up this whole stage talking and just giving a metrics update. So feel free to ask a few questions if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's that's good. I, I think um, maybe a, a few things I'd like to highlight. Uh, if you're new to this, if you're new to on-chain metrics, uh, if we go back to the previous one where you were talking about uh, that's right. The supply on exchanges now, for a for a coin like Bitcoin, where there's you know a limited supply, uh, 21 million. Uh, well, technically, a lot have been lost over the years. So I, I think um, James from uh, Invest Answers uh, he did a calculation where really there's only 14 million in supply, uh, where you know uh, quite a number have been lost. Um, and if that were the case. Um, when you look at the, the supply left on exchanges, uh, and it's a it's a coin with limited supply, that's very bullish because there there's only so many, and if they're not on exchanges, well then the big hodlers are holding on to them, and they're not selling. You know they're they're keeping them um, away from the exchanges, uh, which means the lower the supply, if a sudden surge of demand came to, you know came in from the general population or you know noobs or people who suddenly had the epiphany or had had the aha moment oh you know i have to get some bitcoin well then there's only so much supply on the exchanges so good luck uh, trying to get it cheap yeah so, well said yeah yeah uh yeah that thanks thanks for that Brian. i, I just wanted to to highlight that um, and, and I think what you shared uh, on that metric after that, um, that was, again, you know, really insightful, uh, you know, because you look at this day in and day out, you know, it's just uh, it's it's just normal to you. But but to to folks who have never actually seen on chain metrics, uh, this is amazing. And, and again, you know, I I, I come from the, the traditional space, right, uh, in, in stocks and equity. So uh, if you. If you actually look at the amount of transparency and information that's available out there, you know, um, if you were to use a, a platform like Sentiment, um, you you gain so much more insights into what's actually happening. It's even more transparent uh, with all the because because you know in equities it's a very regulated space, um, and you know and and I've heard so many things thrown at crypto but if you take the time and the effort to look at the the, the metrics uh, and the information that's available it's actually very transparent it's more transparent than you think it is uh, you know even though there's regulators are, are trying to figure out how to how to work through uh, set regulations in, in in different jurisdictions but because the blockchain is is so oh, certain blockchains are, are, are so transparent you know you you can garner so much information from there i, right, I agree i yeah. really agree 
And, uh, you know, on that point, you know, I, we just put out this tweet about, uh, about an hour ago that reflects just how close crypto is, is pegged to equities right now, specifically the S&P 500. Uh, the green line here is Ethereum, uh, which is actually pegged closer, interestingly, to the S&P than Bitcoin right now, even though that hasn't always been the case. But you yeah. can see just how close this green line, you know, maybe this part is a slight exception. But overall, uh, the, it, it appears as though there's some leading indication uh, that's happening from the S&P 500, uh, you know, by like these these areas where like the S&P is flat, that's when they're closed. And then you see the crypto trying to edge higher. And then by the time the market's open again, there's a big drop in crypto to catch up. So I find that really interesting, too. Yeah, yeah that's that's interesting correlation. And gold, too, doing the exact opposite of both. You know, look look at uh, this gold line here compared to the green line. It's like they're they're mirrors of each other at the moment. Yeah, well, that's that's, uh, that's really interesting. So if you if you have a diversified portfolio and and you're you're looking to hedge your portfolio against a very heavily weighted crypto portfolio, you know what to do. And this is uh, obviously what I forgot to mention right at the beginning. None of what we talk about today is is or should be considered financial advice. Yeah, I can it's, say historically, historically, despite it not being financial advice, generally in times of volatility and real world crises, such yeah. as a war or Fed uh, inflation fears, that is when hedges and things like gold tend to be this uh, to this extent reflective uh, against so, like crypto or the S&P. So it won't always be the case, like if the war ended tomorrow or yeah. Fed and inflation fears ended, then this would look differently. But for now, there's a very good explanation for why this looks the way it does. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Now, thanks for that, Brian. All right, I'll, uh, the floor is yours again. Yeah, I mean, look, we can go a, a little bit longer if you'd like, maybe wrap up in five minutes, but I can definitely show a few other things to you. Sure. I, I think we have um, we've probably got a good 20. Oh, perfect. 25 minutes, yeah. Yeah, let's let's dig into plenty of stuff then. There's a lot we can unwrap here. Um, cool. While we are, let me see. I'll take a look at this uh, model next. So this is our funding rates model. And what this is essentially doing is measuring the average funding rate, whether people are going overly long or overly short in uh, showing just how much people are putting their money where their mouth is and betting a, a, either for an asset or, or for the asset to go down. And right now things have mostly neutralized these red dots here show what the funding rates looked like eight hours ago. Blue is 16, and you'll see some green dots reflecting 24 hours ago. Mm -hmm. Mostly things were quite short eight hours ago, but a lot of those shorts have been liquidated. Uh, or they just decided to, because I know that the eight hours, these past eight hours, the price went down mostly. I believe that they probably just closed their shorts at small profits, but usually you'll see funding rates neutralize because uh, the price ticks up really quickly and liquidates a lot of shorts. So that still could have happened, even though prices have uh, kind of actually gone into favor of those funding rates. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, you'll see that whatever the edge is between you know, people shorting too much or people longing too much, the opposite comes true, just like we showed with some of the other social metrics that we covered. Um, you can see, you know, there are a few up here, but these aren't necessarily huge positive funding rates. 0.01 is just around the default anyways, or just above it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're pretty much flat, even though if we looked at things about a week ago, or even like three to four days ago, we were seeing a ton of green bars here. And to prove that, you can see that all of these faint bars, these are the lowest the funding rates have been for any of these assets over the last three days. So this is just pulling the last three days hour by hour and showing what the minimum funding rate is or the maximum funding rate. So you can see very clearly it, through the shadows of these bars, 
-hmm. people were shorting like crazy. And then this big uptick that of course happened today as mm -hmm. the S&P climbed, that liquidated a lot of people. Uh, so the funding rates can be a very, very fun and important metric to keep an eye on to see when the crowd is getting too, over, too overly greedy or too overly fearful about cryptocurrency. There's also another perspective here where you can look at the average funding rate of Bitcoin, which is illustrated in blue, and then the average funding rate of all the altcoins combined that are within about the top 100 or so. That's what this model is following, at least those top 100 that actually have funding rate data, excluding like stable coins, for example, which wouldn't really be relevant data. So we can see that, you know, there was a big uptick here, um, kind of a downtick here. So especially when the Bitcoin funding rate starts to go negative, like it was uh, just, yeah, pretty much exactly 24 hours ago from the time of this recording, this would be a good sign that people were starting to get uh, way too fearful because they saw this uptick and decided that this was a top and it couldn't possibly go too much further. Uh, instead, over the next one, two, three, four, five hours, all the way up to like 12 hours later, the price went higher. And by that time, people were actually longing like crazy. Um, so we want to we want to look for extremes, really, and see when people are are too short or too long on Bitcoin or altcoins. It's mostly started to stay pretty even. But, you know, a few weeks ago, we were seeing dots way down here uh, for both Bitcoin and altcoins. Everybody was shorting like crazy. Um, and for the most part, you know, it's chopped over the last couple of weeks. In fact, you know, obviously we talked about Bitcoin being down 7% over the past month. The past two weeks, it's been kind of like ranging anywhere between 37K to 43K, I think at most. So that people who are trying to leverage long and leverage short, they're probably just pulling out their hair waiting for something significant to happen. Um, and, you know, maybe that that range is enough for them to be happy about the significance of it. But in my opinion, it's it's kind of frustrating everyone that Bitcoin can't really make up its mind whether to break out of this band or not. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's another interesting insight and a, a very useful one at that. Thanks for thanks for sharing that one. Absolutely. And another model that I can show would be our NVT, uh, essentially divergence model that compares the current market cap of Bitcoin versus the amount of unique Bitcoin that is circulating on the network. So it's kind of taking circulation, but equalizing it depending on where the price of Bitcoin is at that given time. Because of course, price give or take roughly matches the market cap at any given time. <coughs> so what we tend to look for, it's pretty intuitive. There's five different colors that display month after month to resemble whether we're super bearish based on not enough circulation happening like this stretch or we're getting, uh, you know, semi bullishness here, or even uber bullishness, like we saw way back in 2017, the last time we got these really, really solid green bars. However, we have seen that even on the yellow green semi -bear, uh, bullish bars here, that's enough to really kickstart Bitcoin on most occasions. Now, many of you might be looking at the last six months and going, well, then what the heck, right? We're, we're kind of on a, a downfall and volatile path, despite us being in semi bullish territory. Well, eventually that tends to even out. Um, it's not quite as going to be as correlative, like as, you know, back in 2019 or 2018, where as soon as we went red, the prices just gradually fell. Um, there's way more major players now that can yeah. cause a lot of volatility in the markets no matter what the fundamentals, especially on the uh, uh, utility end, look like. Um, so if there's not enough circulation, but whales are buying like they were here, that mm -hmm. can still push up the price. If there is a lot of circulation, but whales are dumping like they have since October, that can cause prices to be volatile and go down, even though we're getting a fair amount of circulation. But eventually things even out. And if you're seeing this long-term semi-bullish indicator for the past six months, it's generally a good sign if you hang on. It, it means that there's a limit to quite how much damage can be done 
when the circulation is seeing a healthy amount of utility like we are right now. This one's interesting, Brian, as, as you mentioned, because, you know, I, I, I'd say what, uh, since 2020 was when a lot of the institutions had come in. And so big money have come in and, um, and prior to that, so, so you almost see an evolving, um, you, you, you see the, the reaction of, of, well, based on price evolving uh, over the years where, you know, in 2017, it was mainly retail investors who were, um, who were in the market. And so, um, as you said, uh, the, because there was a lot of circulation that the, the super green bars there, um, it, it, it went as, um, as, uh, as the model showed. And then, um, you know, when, when it came down in, in the red, uh, uh, was it in 20, uh, June, 2021, uh, price went up from there, even though, you know, there, there was low circulation because big whales came in to, to, to buy. So you almost see an evolving, space here where as newer players come into it um you 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 have you have different um uh what would you call it just different uh and an evolving nature of, of of the beast really absolutely yeah I, I think if anything it's not so much that things are more inaccurate and unpredictable now with a model like this it's that it just takes longer for something to develop the last time we saw like a clean signal was probably October where, you know, prices were going down while it was red. And as soon as we turned green again, boom, uh, we got an all time high there and yeah. even an all time high here. Um, yeah. and, but then the last four months, you know, we've stayed relatively healthy in the circulation, but things have dropped. And I think that's due to whale behavior and real time events affecting it. Yeah. So if you can stay dedicated and patient, with mm -hmm. some sort of long-term model like this one that sentiment offers, uh, mm -hmm. I think it generally leads to, to good results and I would stand behind it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. You bet. So what's next? You tell me. Yeah. I mean, let me know uh, if there's like a certain asset that you'd like to, to check I, out for the last five, 10 minutes here or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Look, definitely. Uh, look, I, I think we've probably got about another 15 minutes. Um, let's, uh, so I, I have, um, my, my two favorites that I'd like to look at. Uh, could we take a look at, uh, Litecoin and Ren? Let's check out Litecoin first. So I've, I've got, um, I've, okay. So I've, I've, I've been, a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge uh, Litecoin fan because um, I mean, I, I know that the whole thing about Charlie dumping on the, uh, you know, at, at the all time high and, and all that. Uh, but really, if, if you look at it, if you look at its utility purely on its own, um, it's um, it's pretty much like Bitcoin, except, you know, uh, it, it's got a few things modded into it. Right. It's, it's it has four times as many coins. It's got 84 million coins. Uh, it, it each block is four times faster. So every two and a half minutes, uh, a block gets produced and uh, it is much cheaper to transact uh, on chain at layer one using Litecoin. And it uses script mining instead of uh, SHA-256. So it doesn't compete with, with, uh, with, with Bitcoin. So it's quite complementary in that sense. Um, and what's interesting, what I see really interesting is that, you know, from the chart that you've got here, even though the, the daily active addresses looks, it looks like it's coming down. But if you look at the long term, it's kind of grown, hasn't it, like over the years? Yeah, what I've really found interesting is more recent times. So I just zoomed out to 2017 because you mentioned the Charlie tweet that I, I remember myself the day he put it out because I was first getting into crypto maybe right around here, mid 2017. Uh, mm -hmm. And Litecoin was something that that had done really, really well on that uh, that huge bull run that that topped out in mid December for some. I know Ethereum topped out in early January of 2018. Mm -hmm. But regardless, I know Litecoin was a popular one. And this was, you know, somewhere around here. One of these two, three days was the time that uh, Charlie got out. Mm -hmm. We had one more spike in daily active addresses and then 
people essentially gave up the dream as uh, you know markets crypto wide all dropped off yeah but what's interesting is more recent times i'll just could do something like the last uh we'll do like the last i don't know 12 to 14 months or so so we can see more closely i think this is a really good sign uh where we see daily active addresses going up here mm -hmm. while prices were sliding mm -hmm. um that's a bullish indicator to me because it means that the utility and the amount of unique addresses that are actually transacting their litecoin are moving up despite the suppressed prices that we're seeing right now i think um i think that it's something to to keep in mind along with the circulation my puppy is barking at me so i apologize for that that's all right um and to look at circulation really quick too we can see that uh, it's mostly been moving up. So this is a great sign. Uh, maybe looking at just the last three months. Yeah, I mean, there's a legitimate a legitimate move up in circulation here that I like to see. So that that's a nice sign along with the, this chunk here from February where daily active addresses were really starting to move up. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as average traders go, uh, it appears that on the 30-day time scale, they are in the red, which is a good sign. It means that there is a specific amount of, uh, you know, loss that can be bought into for a lower risk than usual. And mm -hmm. I think that I think that that would be a nice sign for Litecoin as well. One other thing to look at would be Litecoin's uh, whales, where we're seeing anywhere between. I'm just going to put this puppy on my lap. He's nipping at my legs right now. Come here, buddy. <laughs> Everyone Aww. say hi to Griffin. He's cute. What is he? He is a mini schnauzer. Ah, uh, cute. Three months old. <laughs> so Griffin wants to know how the whales are doing for Litecoin, and I'm going to tell him. With prices sitting, oh, my goodness. <laughs> what we're going to do is put him, excuse me, everyone. That's a. All right, so whales. If we're looking at a, an asset that's valued at around $100 right now, we generally want to look for holders that are holding around $100,000 to $10 million uh, USD. So if I do that math, we're looking at something like 1,000 times 100 would be $100,000, all the way up to right around there. We'll do these two groups and it's not looking great. So I'll even zoom this out to the last year. So relatively speaking, it looks like whales really hit their top on October 22nd. And even though we had a big local top here about two weeks after that, the fact that they were already starting to dump, yes, we had one more big spike here because mm -hmm. they accumulated at the bottom to try to see if there would be a bump and then they dropped off again. Yeah. It looks like they've mostly been declining ever since. Um, now they still aren't anywhere near where they were uh, the first half of, of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good sign, but I would be weary of the fact that they aren't really accumulating right now. And after owning at a high about 31.9% of the supply, they're down to a modest, 30.4 now, which may not sound like much, but when you talk about the entire supply of Litecoin, yeah. you know, 1.5% yeah. is, is a lot of millions of dollars. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. So that's, yeah. Would, would that also signify that if the whales are dumping, so we would have more retail distribution? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that would probably be best answered by looking at the daily active addresses just okay. to see how much how much more uh, you know overall activity there is amongst unique addresses mm -hmm. and obviously we have seen that big uptick here despite the suppressed prices so i'd yeah. say there is evidence of that um it would be nice if we didn't have this current drop off that that we've seen over the past two yeah. to three weeks mm -hmm. but all things considered that's probably the case you know we can even look at uh a few other tiers, right? We looked at 
we looked at, um, where is it? Oh, I see it's over here. So we looked at a thousand to a hundred thousand over there, but if we looked at like the tier right below it, a hundred to 1000 Litecoin, they're staying low right now. Yeah. We look at 10 to 100, they've actually been accumulating pretty hard, which is quite interesting. So if we look at just how the 10 to 100 holders correlate with the price, um, mm -hmm. not, not very well. If anything, you know, the people who take a, a gamble on Litecoin for a few thousand dollars, yep. they've been mostly wrong. So like the accumulators <laughs> from, from January 21st up until now, They've yeah. watched the price go down as their holdings went up. So they're hoping yeah. that, you know, this is just a really long-term dip right now. But yeah. you can see how much they dumped off here back yeah. in April. This was when Bitcoin had its first all-time high, too, mm -hmm. um, of, of 2021, that was. But they dropped a ton of Litecoin here prior to the price going up. So this could almost be looked at as a counter indicator. But it does show evidence of exactly what you were theorizing, Andy, of more accumulation happening um, yep. and, and dispersal of addresses over time yep. to other uh, yep. smaller addresses. So like one to 10 kind of rising as well. Interesting yep. that this tier is dropping 0.1 to 1. So that's like the, you know, $10 to $100 tier. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's, already, it's there's so much alpha and fascinating things you can find by looking at that holder distribution yeah. chart. Definitely. And just to make sure we have time, you know, I'll, I'll yeah. give you a quick recap on Ren. Sure. It does appear as though we just had a, a big spike in circulation. In fact, it was the biggest we saw. It was even larger than the one in May. So I'll have to go back a couple of years. Wow. So the last time we saw a circulation spike this big was February of 2021. So we're looking at just about a 13 month high in Ren moved. And it does appear that these spikes in circulation have correlated with bottoms like mm -hmm. this one last in, in late January and this one that happened just a couple of days ago. Yep. Uh, price, prices react positively to these. And even this one, to an extent, it was a bit more of a delayed effect, but the circulation spikes tend to happen after prices have been suppressed. And then you see an evident uptick either immediately yep. or a few days later. This was a great example. Uh, prices moving up on the spike. This one's an okay example. You know, obviously the price moved down, but you get the idea. I think circulation plays a, a large factor for a, an asset like REN that's in that I don't know what the market cap rank is, but it fluctuates between like the 30 to 80 range. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's definitely interesting to see that daily active addresses. On the other hand, not a lot of, of encouraging signs here. There's mm -hmm. only about only 280 to 320 daily active addresses a day. Most of the time we'd like to see that start to grow once again, um, mm -hmm. back in September when Ren was going on a bit of a run. We were at least seeing a, a few big spikes like this. Uh, yeah. We wouldn't always necessarily need to see huge spikes, but something that kind of shows that more addresses are specifically getting into Ren without just the general crypto uh, sphere all growing together. Yeah, yeah. MVRV, it, it does look like average traders are up a bit, up about 12.5%. I'll zoom back in here just the last three months. So yeah, it is up again. This would be a, a slight local top indicator, what we're seeing right now. It actually is, now that we're zoomed in, it's at 18.7%, which is pretty significant. Mm. Supply and exchanges is looking pretty good. It had been dropping for quite a while. It's interesting that you know it dropped right until around the price bottom and then mm -hmm. prices began to rise. So that's fascinating to see. And then as far as supply distribution goes, with Ren at a little over 40 cents. Uh, let's see, we'll take off these. We'll look at just the su percentage supply held. So let's say we're looking at the 1 million, 1 million and up crew, kind of flat. Let's try to take off the infinity because the reason we try not to go that high is so many of those 
holders at that level are exchange addresses, yeah. but this one probably not as much. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's painting painting a not so great sign ever since prices started to rise. They were holding at about 39.6% of the supply a little over a week ago. Now they're down to 36.1. So these whales have dropped about three and a half percent of the supply just in the past week. I'd be concerned about that. It doesn't necessarily yeah. mean the rally is going to stop, but those key stakeholders that can really control the price, they're, they're telling us that they've they've kind of bowed out or at least taken some profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as far as anything else goes, uh, exchange flow balance, nothing too crazy there. We did see a huge network realized profit loss spike just two days ago. Uh, what this means is uh, the total profit or total loss on the network, someone sold their bags at a massive loss here. Massive, massive, 31.09 million uh it looks i mean it's easily the largest spike in the last three months if we went to the last year still the largest spike wow. largest largest two years yeah this might have been like maybe wow. the biggest network realized profit loss spike ever going back to 2017 i think it is i think it is it's hard to tell when it's this zoomed out because there can be some misleading data right at the end but yeah, overall, it looks very likely that this was that spike from a couple of days ago is the biggest loss uh, that was recorded in a long time. And I, I think I think that was a really good bottom indicator, what we're seeing here, probably better than any other metric we just looked at, because when these bottom spikes happen of this significance, um, the loss has to be compensated for by a price rise eventually. And if you buy at these spikes, you'll generally come out ahead just as if you sell at these top spikes um, or at least take some profit, you're coming out ahead most of the time too and making a wise decision there. Wow. That's a massive spike down. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It really yeah. is crazy. Wow. That's the biggest, right? That we've seen historically yeah, yeah. for rent. Yeah. It looked like it. And then, you know, you can even look at development activity where uh, sentiment scrapes the amount of GitHub submissions uh, it ignores really mundane submissions like a Slack update or something that might show up in the GitHub and really only focuses on the ones that are notable. So lately, let me zoom out a little bit. It looks like there has been a bit of an uptick, but Ren's development activity doesn't look the greatest. Mm -hmm. It's not looking awful by any means. We don't like as long as it's not showing like zero development activity or barely, you know, a few spikes, then it's fine. But over like a year, we generally like to see a, a steady rise showing that the team is getting bigger and there's more and more innovation. Mm -hmm. That's not quite the case right now, which is a little surprising because I like REN too. I think it has some potential as a very unique technology. Yeah. Uh, but it, it has seen these interesting little lulls, which could be just, you know, the team's on vacation and nothing more, or it could be something more substantial. Uh, but yeah. if people wanted to go into the GitHub and see what's going on, there yep. would certainly be some specific details as to why that drop off happened. I I wonder if it's because rents kind of where they are right now, and then whether or not the teams helping the other teams on board onto Ren level, you know, layer one. Because effectively, Ren has gotten themselves to a point where they have Ren JS and and Ren VM, where uh, effectively they transform themselves into an interoperable layer one solution so uh i i think there are um there, there's a couple of, of projects one's called catalog and the other one's called uh oh this one's a separate project called varin x where they use ren um and it's an interoperable dex uh running on top of of, of ren layer one so uh it's interesting I, I i wonder if the the market has recognized that yet or uh I, I, and maybe uh, we're looking for more projects to onboard and start using uh, the Ren Layer One as a as a as a smart contract platform for interoperability because I think they've already connected out to seven seven chains, so it's going to be interesting to watch this one. 
Yeah, I mean, you're by far more of a rent expert than than me because I kind of keep more of a, uh, I, I keep an eye on the general markets a little more, even though rent is one that I've I've seen great great things about and stories written about it. Um, but I think your theory could absolutely have some truth to it and and be an explanation for why we've seen some of these fluctuations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, look, hey, Brian, thanks so much for your time. And and I know it's getting really late uh, and you've probably had a really long day. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for jumping on. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, appreciate you taking time out. Um, and it's way past uh, your dinner time. So uh, I'm going to let you go. And uh, uh, I just want to say thank you again. And last words from you. It's been a pleasure, Andy. It's always a blast to come on and talk metrics with you. And, uh, you know, if your community ever wants to have some specific assets to look at um, and, and you send them my way in advance of the call, I can prepare some specific charts so we can kind of dive deep into what those assets look like for your community. I think it's always a lot of fun. And if people want more explanations just about the general metrics and how they work, that's something I can do. Um, and of course, I'm sure you've mentioned this to your community in past calls. Anyone who comes to sentiment.net and adds the code equities tracker when they get a membership, they get, uh, I believe, 25% off of their first month. It's already quite affordable. You know, some of our competitors are hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Ours starts at 44 bucks a month. Uh, and we feel that not just us being cheaper, but the fact that we offer more metrics. Uh, than any cryptocurrency site on the planet, not just for the sake of being more, but actually good metrics is a pretty good reason uh, for why I stand pretty proud behind this company. And uh, I, I really encourage anyone to check it out and see see what's going on with the markets behind the hood and, and improve their trading right away. Yeah, definitely. It's 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 a fantastic platform. And, and that's why we choose to, to work with uh, Sentiment. Uh, it's definitely the best out there. All right, Brian, Thanks, we're not going to hold you back anymore. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we'll see you the next Tuesday of next month. Yeah, uh, Thursday, absolutely. Thursday. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, no worries. I look forward to it and uh, I wish you all the best and stay safe out there. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Brian. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.